This other microphone should be on too. So that one should work check, too. Check one, two. Can you hear me okay? Nice. Hi, y'all. I'm Trevor Rourke, and I run Curbwise LLC. It's a bicycle powered delivery operation here in central Wisconsin. Um, I am a single person power machine right now, and uh, no e assist yet. We were just talking about that, but um, using just human capital at this point, um, trying to go up against the, the big the big guns throughout the nation. No, just kidding, not really. DoorDash, Grubhub, all those folks. They have kind of a different business model than I, I run, um, but I'm trying to use the triple bottom line uh, business model to basically bring goods and deliver as much as possible in this area. So go bike power. I'm Kelly Athlington. I'm a, an owner of Bucket Ruckus. Previously was a project of Rising Sand Organics, the Cryptide Compost Collection. Business has now pivoted, it's, it's, it's a new LLC. I own it along with my partner, Asher Malapard. And uh, we pick up kitchen scraps from people's homes and businesses around the Stevens Point area, a little bit into Clover, and we compost that material at White Feather Organics currently. So um, that's who I'm here representing. I did go to UWSP for waste management graduated five years ago. And uh, thanks so much for, for having me here. And thanks so much for having me here too. My name is Dan Dietrich. I uh, taught here for 35 years in the English department. And when I retired, I became a full-time volunteer, um, mainly for the uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, also involved with other environmental organizations such as Wild Ones, which is worth it just to join it for the name. But anyway, uh, Native Plants, Natural Landscapes is the rest of the name of that outfit. Involved with other groups dealing with um, climate change but Citizens Climate Lobby is the main one. I am the leader of the local chapter, the Stevens Point chapter. We have about 500 people on our email list. And um, I'm also the co-coordinator for the state of Wisconsin as a volunteer for a Citizens Climate Lobby. We have about two dozen, a little fewer than that right now, but um, chapters all over the state. And we do a variety of things, but the main goal is to keep this a livable planet. And we can talk more about that as we go through this session. <clears throat> My name is Trevor Drake and I'm the executive director of uh, Central Rivers Farm Shed. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that's centered around food and our mission is to build a more resilient local food economy. Um, because food's such a center point of um, everybody's life, I have the privilege to kind of intersect just about everybody on this panel in some way or another, whether it's growing food, uh, producing um, food uh, value added markets for farmers, or just understanding how the energy that goes into the food system could be more renewable and sustainable. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> oh, hi, I'm Nick Hyla. I'm really happy to be here. Proud UWSP graduate also. Um, I'm the director of the Midwest Renewable Energy Association and also a substitute teacher here at UWSP. Uh, professor uh, took another job three weeks before class started last semester, so they asked me to fill in, so I do that. Kenzie can tell you how, how good of a job or not I'm doing. <laughs> And, uh, and at the MREA, we've been around for over 30 years. We were started um, kind of in some ways as a, in response to the first Gulf War, which um, you know, after, after the first invasion of Iraq, uh, there's an editorial that went out in a publication called Home Power Magazine. And the editorial was to focus efforts on local uh, education about domestic energy opportunities to end this kind of like endless war for oil. And so a group of folks in Amherst, just outside of town, got in a farm kitchen and uh, organized the first energy fair. And the 3,000 people came and we're gonna do our 31st event, June 24th through 26th. I hope you know we're there. And I'm happy to talk with you all today about what we do. I'm, I'm going to be the man behind the camera today, so nobody's going to get to see me, but I will. They'll be hearing me. Uh, so uh, my name is Dave Barbier. I'm the sustainability coordinator here. 
up until yesterday, I didn't know I'd be posing the questions for you, but that's how Earth Week goes, so here I am. Um, so our Earth Week committee has uh, gone through um, a sort of a brainstorming and curating process for you all. So we have uh, we got nine questions to roll through in the next hour. Um, I was given instructions to make sure we start on different people at every question. So I'm just going to keep you guessing who I'm going to call on first, depending on the question. Um, and then we'll basically just go down the line like you did. Uh, all the two other standard microphones work too. So if you don't want to play a game of pass all the way along, you can just use those microphones. Um, unfortunately, it sounds like everybody can hear me in this room, even though I don't have a microphone. It's great. Um, so the qu first question that we've got for you, uh, and I'll start with uh, I'll start with the curve wise gentleman here, Trevor, uh, and then we'll, we can work our way down and we can sort of feed off each other. Uh, how do you view the role of leadership in your organization and in the community? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> okay, so uh, as far as my role and curve wise's role in the community. Um, when I'm basically doing my work, it's kind of automatic to be a leader. It's kind of nice. Um, so yes, my work is cut out for me because I am, uh, depending on the day of the week, battling the elements, um, to battling and weaving in between cars and trucks. Um, it's at the same time, a novelty to some people because they see this interesting looking cargo tricycle on the roadway, which they've never seen before. I think people are getting kind of used to it here in, in central Wisconsin, which is a really nice thing too. Um, and that's kind of how I envision what I'm trying to do is normalize this operation. Um, when people see it as normal, and, and again, stepping back, this is the leadership that I want to bring to it. When people start seeing it as normal, they will patronize it. They'll think, oh, well, you know, Eight months ago, I thought this guy was a, a radical bike nut, but now I notice he's delivering food that I order online each week. Okay, well, what the heck? I'll just give it a shot, and I see him out in the snow. Okay, um, so for me, it's it's very natural uh, to do it to showcase uh, what I'm doing, just some of the simple operations. So, um, yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I feel like I want to hear more answers before I get mine. <laughs> it's possible I didn't totally understand the question, but um, I feel like I kind of kind of similar have like a you know, Bucker Ruckus right now is the only organization in the area that's doing what we're doing. So we also kind of have like a natural leadership role being kind of like the pioneering organization of people who are doing this. And I'm I'm stoked to be in that position. I feel really grateful. I think it's long overdue for this community to have a business that uh, services homes and organizations and businesses in the area doing what we do. Um, I feel very excited to learn more about our community so I can so I can make this business be a good leader for this kind of development of the waste and resource industry. Um, I think that's probably all I got for right now on that one. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. As far as uh, leadership within my organization, uh, my goal is motivation. It's to get the members of my crew to keep going, uh, despite, despite a lot of uh, obstacles in our way, including COVID, including uh, war in, in uh, Ukraine, including um, the recession, a thousand other things. My job is to keep our people focused on climate change and get our job done within uh, Wisconsin, and the larger world. As far as within our community, uh, what is my role? My role is to bring attention to the subject of climate change. Um, what's going on in, uh, with COVID is millions of people are dying. The, uh, what's going on with uh, climate change is millions of people more, vastly more, uh, will be dying if we don't do something about climate change. In uh, terms of uh, Ukraine, I am, very supportive of what the Ukrainian people are doing to defend themselves. Uh, the approach that we take in our organization is we use democracy in order to deal with climate change. And what's going on at the moment in the Ukraine is an 
authoritarian regime, regime is attempting to destroy a democracy uh, illegally. So we very much support the Ukrainian people and are anxious to see um, them uh, defend themselves from this illegal takeover. So here in our community, I try to get people involved in climate change action. I do that by uh, working with the uh, hundreds of other people in my chapter to um, hold meetings, to hold um, presentations. Before COVID hit, we were having a um, first Thursday event at the library every first Thursday of the month with some topic related to climate change. It might be agriculture and climate change. It might be national security and climate change. So it's the idea is to educate people so that they know what the heck is happening. We also try to have good relationships with other organizations in our community, such as 350 Stevens Point, which is a, a UWSB organization, which does wonderful work. And if you're all not members, sign up immediately or sooner. Um, so that kind of thing. I, I try to get the word out, try to lead other people to get them to do what's best for all of us in the world. Uh, we are a nonpartisan organization. If uh, yet another um, derecho hits my area, uh, whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat, I'm gonna be affected by it. And 75% uh, of the people in the United States are aware that climate change is happening and they want the federal government to do something about it. I'm gonna do my best to help them get that done. Man, that'll be hard to follow. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say, you can't cheat and look at his answer. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the questions here. Um, so first, I, I think I'll answer that in two parts. Within my organization, um, I kind of view myself as like kind of a mediocre talent, but I make sure I'm surrounded by extremely talented people and passionate people. And then it's just about seeing their vision, listening to their vision and supporting them to execute that. As long as it delivers and aligns to our mission, right? I think that's kind of my role there. Um, within our community, I'd say it's similar. Um, I mean, I get to understand how we aggregate resources from generous donors and how we can then activate those resources into supporting innovators like Trevor and Kelly um, and help them thrive and continue to enhance their impact. So I think really it's just, you know, surrounding, a good leader should really surround themselves with talent and then support that talent. Trevor, <clears throat> get on one quality is humility. Um, that's good in leadership. Um, MREA is, we have 21 full time people now, so a pretty small organization. And, um, and I started there as a volunteer at the Energy Fair, uh, moving garbage around and cooking pizzas at the cafe. And, uh, and what I can say is that most. Um, most of the most important qualities of leadership are not something that you might notice right away. And it's um, being authentic. Uh, people tend to over, they tend to give you more time and more energy if they feel like you're giving them your real person. Um, being gracious and trying to find common ground with people, I think is important. You know, the, the challenge I feel like we have in general with all of the issues that we feel are important is that I think that there are a majority of people, voting people in this county, in this state, in this country that all agree on, what, on certain things and that if we were more gracious and, um, and more welcoming and more supportive of those issues and less divisive that we could have instead of maybe an epitaph that is the largest waste of money in the world's history for America, which could possibly still happen. Maybe it's happening right now. Um, so I think what I've learned is that uh, always give people a second chance, um, always uh, support their strengths and minimize their weaknesses and, uh, and just work hard. Uh, work hard and uh, probably the best thing you can do is always do what you're saying you're going to do. Um, commit, commit to the actions you're going to take. Great, thank you. Um, that's a great answer. Um, 
Our next question, Trevor, will start with you since you're mic'd up. Nick was quick. To <laughs> <laughs> um, so our next question is uh, a two-parter, so you have to pay attention. Um, what does Stevens Point and the Central Wisconsin community need to do to create a better relationship with the environment? What are the most urgent actions regarding that? So I'll repeat that one more time. What does Stevens Point and the Central Wisconsin community need to do to create a better relationship with the environment? What are the most urgent actions? Sure. <clears throat> sure. I'm going to come at this a little biased. Um, what I did not mention in my intro is I'm a UWS alum too, come from the dietetics program. So very passionate about food. So this answer is going to tie directly to food, no surprise there. Um, but I think the most immediate thing, what we can do uh, is really just examine how we can shorten our food chain. Um, I don't think somebody needs to get, you know, a hyper local focused diet right off the bat, but definitely take advantage of any opportunity you have to shorten your food chain, whether that's you go procure something yourself, forage, hunt, fish for it. Um, you grow a strong relationship with a local farmer who you can actually observe and get to know their practices of farming. Um, even if it's just setting aside some small amounts of your budget and shopping at the uh, local farmer's market. Um, I think all of those things uh, equivalent to shortening your food chain. Um, and I think when you do take more ownership and start to avoid, uh, explore food sovereignty, you're just naturally gonna, through the lens of food, you're just gonna naturally build a better appreciation for your environment because the two things are directly aligned. Um, what are the most urgent actions? I think, yeah, I, I mentioned it several times, just really take an exam examine yourself, your habits, your routines, and just understand what small changes could you do that you're comfortable with so you can build to overall large lifestyle changes. First of all, I want to say um, he had mentioned that most of the people up here are involved with his organization, uh, Farm Shed, which we are. I'm a member. I'm also a member of MREA, have been for a long time. And um, I I'm also do a lot of composting at my house. So I'm, I'm involved there. The one I'm not involved with is uh, the other Trevor because I'm outside of Stevens Point and it would be a long bike ride, I think, for you to, to bring your stuff to the town of Hall where I live. But I certainly admire what he's doing and um, urge anybody in the Stevens Point area to take advantage of it. Um, what, does, what, does pe what do people in, in central Wisconsin need to do um, to create a better envir environmental relationship. Uh, there are a lot of things we can do. Uh, we can eat a better diet. Um, my church is in involved with the uh, um, giving gardens, which is, was, at least, I don't know if it still is or not, a run through farm shed and your office. Yeah, it's, so. We support giving gardens. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, it's, again, talking about how we relate with one another, but it will come as no surprise to any of you that what I think is the most uh, important thing, the most urgent action that any of us can take is dealing with climate change. If um, climate continues to change the way it is, we are all of us gonna be in, in far more serious trouble than we're already in. And we're already in very serious trouble. I just got here today, zooming in from, uh, Minnesota, where my son, after years of my persuasion, has moved from Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is not a great place to live if you believe that climate change is real because they're in the midst of a, uh, a drought that is the most severe drought in 1,200 years, and it's only getting started, according to the climate scientists. So um, here in central Wisconsin, we're going to have a lot, a lot of things. According to FEMA, we ought to worry about fires, wildfires. We ought to worry about flooding from streams and lakes. We ought to worry about heat. Those are the three top that they talk about. And all those are very important. Uh, the greatest deaths at the moment from climate change come from heat, 
people dying from uh, heat prostration, people dying from um, heart attacks res resulting from the, the enormous heat that they have to suffer. Um, here in central Wisconsin, I've got another worry and that worry is migration, weirdly enough. Uh, the same thing that's hitting the Mediterranean with people migrating from all over the place, including at the moment the Ukraine. They're, they're expecting 8 million people from the Ukraine to migrate out of the Ukraine by the end of that war. Uh, from Syria, from uh, Afghanistan, we have uh, 100,000 people coming into the U.S. from Afghanistan. A lot of people coming here, but there are also going to be a lot of people coming here from Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, and similar places, Arizona, um, Southwest, uh, the West also being hit very hard by a variety of things. Um, Louisiana, uh, hurricanes, um, droughts, I don't know. So uh, we have to confront this. We, we have talked about it. I've been a member of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby for 10 years now, and we've been working that whole time with members of Congress. Um, what I wanna see happen is that the members of the central Wisconsin community tell the, their representatives and their senators in the Congress of the United States of America that we would prefer uh, to keep Wisconsin as close to what it is now and what it has been as possible. There are a lot of things gonna happen here and in the rest of the United States that are not gonna be real pretty. And no matter what we do, those things are gonna happen because um, there is already enough uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it lasts for one to 200 years up there, by the way. So that our climate change isn't over, even if we were all to stop all carbon emissions today, it would still be going on. But the worst impacts of climate change, which we have not yet experienced, uh, they can be stopped if we will take action now. That's what the climate scientists said. The most recent uh, inter intergovernmental panel on climate change report, which only came out a few weeks ago, said that if, if, uh, if this is not a matter for throwing up your hands and, and running around and screaming, uh, nor is it a matter for uh, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we're all going to die. Uh, we are going to die eventually, but that's beside the point. <laughs> anyway, um, we, we, there are things they say that we can do, and we have to do them. We have to pull the carbon out of the atmosphere. We have to stop emitting the carbon. Uh, President Biden has a plan that's on the table. Congress is still deciding on it. I urge you to contact your members of Congress. I urge you to contact President Biden. It is ridiculously easy to do. It will take you five minutes. And you could tell them, we would prefer to have a, a, a livable planet. We would prefer to have a, a livable environment here in uh, Wisconsin. And the best way to do that would be to get Congress to implement his plan at the moment, which calls for a 50% reduction, I believe, by 2030 or something like that, and even higher reductions um, by 2050. Uh, we can do this if we put our minds to it. And um, that's what I think we ought to be working on. Uh, I would say so the question is, what does Stephen's point and the Central Wisconsin community need to do to create a better relationship with the environment? What are the most urgent actions? I think that um, there are a lot of, the, the situation we're in is urgent. And so there are a lot of urgent actions that we can take. I think that perhaps the most urgent is to uh, collectively improve our communication skills with each other because we are, we are certainly in the midst of a climate crisis and that's what we're, we're fighting for here. And if we can't have healthy and fulfilling supportive relationships with each other at the end of it all, then I'm not really sure what it is we're fighting for actually. Um, so I would say that there, there are improvements to be made everywhere all across the board certainly, but I especially think that we all need to consider the way that we care for ourselves, the way we care for each other, and how we engage with the people around us in our in our community immediately and the greater broader community. Um, that's that's my hill. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, going last, I think I have it maybe the hardest. I'm gonna piggyback up. Oh, that's right. Nick's got it. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. <laughs> um, to re rekindle that relationship with uh, our Mother Earth, uh, it's a difficult one. One, uh, one really important com component, I think, to this where we've seen the disconnection, especially um, in the United States, is uh, really fundamentally, it comes down to the automobile. 
Um, the fact that we utilize these machines so much for almost everything. Uh, I think I, I will throw a disclaimer out there. I'm not anti-automobile, I'm not anti-car. I'm just anti-overuse and anti-over-accommodation of uh, these vehicles. When we get so far as to do everything in our vehicles, uh, from groceries to picking up kids to meeting up for a date or uh, you know whatever it might be going to work, we are so disconnected from each other. Uh, just and that's picking up piggybacking off Kelly here with relationships. We used to know our neighbors more. Um, I know social media has a little bit to do with that as well, the, the internet. But we used to know our neighbors more. We used to have uh, more connections with our friends just by walking by their house. We used to uh, meet up and do things outside more with our friends, our family. We used to have more random interactions, and that's really key, something we have kind of disconnected from. When we build those relationships with each other outside of the automobile, it's an automatic reconnection with nature, automatic reconnection with the trees that are above you, um, the native flowers that you see while you're walking by, uh, the bee you get stung by because you're messing, you're messing around with that crosswalk. <laughs> but there's so many connections that we can make just on a walk, uh, or just on a bike ride. Um, and I'll maybe end with this. And one of my favorite things about riding a bicycle is I get to smell the lilacs in the spring, like intensely. It's so awesome. Uh, when you're riding a car, yes, if you have your window rolled down or something, you might get that smell. Most of the time you'll miss it. Uh, that's one of the things I love about reconnecting. Uh, okay, local, most important thing we can do for the local environment. Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, starting with a specific list of what I think people might identify would be groundwater issues, um, urban sprawl, our energy use and energy portfolio. Um, you know, the challenge obviously is that most issues that we want to address, that most of the, the policy levers or, um, you know, the ways to address them are outside of local control. So, of federal state policy. Um, and so in some ways, I think when it comes to what we do locally, the probably the largest detriment to progress in environmental issues is our inability to organize effectively and, um, and to build bigger big tent coalitions that mobilize voting. You know, I get this all the time at work because we work on energy issues. You know, well, the Pew Charitable Trust, when we survey people, you know, 80% of people know that climate change is happening and, and a bipartisan majority support clean energy development. But who votes and prioritizes the vote of those issues? And most of the time, you know, in political, as our political op opposition, we create caricatures of people and we draw the lines and we refuse to, to work locally to kind of build coalitions that are truly bipartisan or nonpartisan. And so I think I agree with Kelly um, in some ways on a local level about the need for mindfulness and relationships. And, um, and I think it's possible that, you know, we, we live in, we live in, if you, we're, we, we basically won the lottery by living here. Um, and and I think that most people that live here, regardless of their political position, would agree. I would love to have a cleaner environment. I would love to, to have more uh, conservation areas. I would love to have cleaner groundwater. Um, and I think the first step in getting there is uh, positive relationships. You know, one of the things that, um, that I think really is a, a major red flag in Portage County is that when it comes to groundwater issues, it has become an existential crisis for the farm. So if you, if you follow Wisconsin farm policy, just for like a brief history, you know, the Walker administration, when it comes to dairy farms, you know, they launched their like 2020 program. Scott Walker's first trade mission was to China and he came back promising that China was going to buy, uh, you know, 
actual cheese from Wisconsin and the consumers were prepared to buy real cheese. They were buying you know, whey product and dehydrated product uh, for, for food production, but they were gonna buy cheese. And so Wisconsin was a big opportunity for Wisconsin farms. So it was 20 billion weight by 2020 and you know, robotic milkers and CAFOs and high capacity wells and just supporting the farm. Well, we know how that turned out. We increased our production greatly, but China never bought the cheese. Consumption and cheese consumption has been flat or declining. So prices have gone way, way down, and we've been losing 500 family farms in Wisconsin a year. You know, Wisconsin is a unique landscape because we have a very strong state cooperative law that allows small farms to band together to value add and reap the financial benefits of those value additions through cooperative farms. But that farm life is under extreme pressure. And you know, farm suicides are high and have been for the last five years and you can just drive through the countryside in Portage County and you can see a struggling farm after a struggling farm. And so what do we as the environmental community do? We create an existential crisis for these farms by wishing they wouldn't exist. Like you're polluting our groundwater, we want you gone. Now in that type of binary relationship, of course it will be opposite. Are there other methods? Can we better support farms and farm life in Wisconsin through conservation means and through more local food production means and through a greater positive collaboration that gets us both outcomes that we want? We want our real character. We need local food production. We need farm families. That's why we like Wisconsin. We want clean drinking water. I think it is possible, but under the current construct, the most important thing that we can do is depoliticize, de-escalate, reconcile, and work together. I'm going to hop in if I can. You said before we could follow up with people. So I want to, I want to follow up and just kind of uh, support just what everybody has said, especially uh, what Nick just said, but what everyone said. Um, we were talking, uh, Kelly was talking about communication skills. and. So is Nick. Uh, how do we communicate with one another? This is a driving force behind um, our work in Citizens Climate Lobby. It's not enough to have a, a group of uh, progressives say, this is what we ought to do. It's gotta be a group of human beings in, the, on, in, in our community, in, in the state, in the nation, in the world. We have to get together on this. And we can't do this if we demonize the other side. If the other side demonizes us and we demonize the other side, we're dead. So our organization, one of the reasons I, I joined it is because it's, it's got a, a basis on three words, respect, admiration, and appreciation. We walk in to meet with Senator Tammy Baldwin, we show her our respect, our appreciation, and uh, we set up a good human relationship. We walk in to see Senator Ron Johnson, we walk in and we show him our respect and our appreciation and we set up a human relationship and those human relationships are what are gonna either determine our success or our failure. And it isn't an easy thing because we've all been taught that the other side, whatever other side it might be, are vermin. We aren't the first ones that have come up with this concept, by the way, Hitler did too. Um, those people are vermin and we are humans. Well, we're doing the same thing in our country and it is extremely destructive. We have to learn how to talk with one another and support one another. Um, they aren't vermin, they're humans, just like you and me. And um, I've learned a lot from, from my membership in CCL on exactly how to do that. We've got a ton of information that's been made, made available to us on how to set up decent relationships with other human beings. Um, other thing it says here is autos. We, we overuse autos and that certainly is, is correct. Let's put the word down. And it certainly is correct, we wait, use too many autos. Um, we have one auto in our family. We live five miles north of town and we have one auto. Uh, every couple of weeks, that's a little inconvenient because I want to go one direction and my wife wants to go in another direction. And it's a little inconvenient. Uh, the world goes on, you know. Um, using a bicycle is an awfully smart move. You'll live longer if you use it. And if you want to know more about how to do that, talk to that Trevor. I'm done. Great. Um, I can tell you we're not going to get through online questions in an hour, so, uh, but that's okay, because uh, then I get more flexibility to sort of 
pop around and pick and choose my question. Nice. Um, so uh, the next question um, has to do with our capitalistic system that we're currently operating under and how that affects your work. And so it says, how does operating a business or an organization under a capitalistic, unsustainable economic system impact your work? So how does operating a business or organization under a capitalistic, unsustainable economic system impact your work? And Dan, since you've got the mic, I'll let you get started. First of all, I, I agree that uh, a capitalistic system is unsustainable as an economic system. I personally agree with that. Um, my organization is a nonprofit organization. We, we are in an economic system that is less than perfect. I always think of, I don't even know who said this, but it always comes to mind that somebody said, uh, the democratic system of government is the worst governmental system in the world, except for all the others. And um, I think Putin has certainly demonstrated that. Um, but that's a, a political system. As far as an economic system, the capitalist system is also a deeply fought, flawed system. There are other systems out there. Um, the communist system is one of those, and there are advantages to it. There are really large disadvantages to it when you put it into practice. So our, our group does what we can within the system we've been given, and um, that's what we do. Uh, we have shown growth. We have uh, got hundreds of thousands of people who are involved here in Wisconsin. We have 6,000 uh, members of our group or supporters of it. Uh, and we work within that system to try to change at a federal level uh, what's happening. Is that gonna be enough? No, no. A, a little recycling would, would help. A, a little composting would help. Using bicycles would, would help. There's a million other things we can do. And our, our approach is not gonna solve all of the world's problems, but it's the, uh, uh, it is one step. And we certainly support all the other steps as well. To whom do I give this next? Whoever you want. It gets to be. Uh, well, I I feel like I'm at a little bit bucker ruckus at least is that a little bit of an advantage just because of the the rest of the names in the game. Um, most businesses that are in the solid waste and recycling industry, they've grown they've outgrown any opportunity to be associated with anything other than capitalism. So um, we're still a very small company. I think we've got a great shot at uh, maintaining an, an unconventional way of doing business and existing here and I look forward to that. Um, one of the things that I I like thinking about is maintaining a free way for people to compost. So we have a free drop site in town that people can bring their things to their organics to to compost with us. And every now and then I consider like maybe we should charge for that because there's no other business I know that does what we do that provides a free service like that. Even if you transport your own material and you have your own container for it, you still have to pay to, to put it in the bin. And um, I've considered that, but I, I always end up, you know, going back to, to providing this free option because it, it would just be really unjust if there was absolutely no way for everybody here to keep their food scraps out of the landfill. So that might be a small thing, but that did come to mind as like an answer to that question. Um, I also want to do what I can to maintain the, the goals of what we're doing, which is, yes, we want to be a successful and viable business so that we can keep doing what we're doing and I can someday have a, you know, my livelihood can come from this if we would spend all my time doing it anyway. Um, and, but beyond that, I think it's really important to help the community that we exist in to divert more organics from landfill disposal, period whether that's households, schools, businesses, um, our local government agencies. Um, I, I really wanna maintain that as a high priority for our business and me personally. And um, I, think that, I think that's a little unconventional. Um, I don't think that every business out there has the community in mind. And I think that's why I'm here with these people because that's a big part of what we do. So that's that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, <clears throat> in terms of um, my business, uh, curb wise with uh, bicycle power delivery, uh, I think it's easier 
and hard all at the same time. Uh, how is it harder? Well, what's interesting is with our current economic system, uh, we have essentially been institutionalized or been trained to think that when you get a good or a product, it should be easy. It should be simple, um, it should be fast, and there shouldn't be much to think about. That's because of all the interesting layers that have come along the way in subsidizing those costs, externalizing those costs. Obviously, climate change is one of those externalized costs. Um, so why is it harder? Well, <clears throat> I provide a service that's focused on quality. It's not as fast. Guaranteed, I can't bike as fast as a car. <laughs> can race it a hundred times, but um, there are moments where if it's a very short trip, I might actually get there sooner than a car because of stoplights or because I can park certain places and the car can't. There's certain things like that in an urban environment that work. Um, however, most of the time, I really can't make it more convenient, if you will. Um, one way it's easier is because <clears throat> I focus on the triple bottom line. And because of that, and the, the fact that I wanna build relationships with local businesses, local partners, and local customers, as opposed to wholesaling and selling as much as I can to make profit, I can focus on the quality of that service, right? So relationships with people, that's easier my, what would be called a competition, you know, uh, national brands that do deliveries or even uh, deliveries from local businesses that have their own cars and trucks. Um, it's harder for them to build those relationships with their customers because it's all about speed. It's all about get their thing, you know, get it to you, monetizing online, monetizing online. Um, so I have a bit of an advantage over that. I can build those relationships better. It's more slow, you know, it's more slower development, slower growth, um, but it is a little bit easier for me with that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some philosophy and some practicality in this question, I guess. Um, makes me want to talk about history, so I'll talk a little about history. Um, you know, I think the history of energy, let's say electricity in the United States, was a public response, an adequate and even sometimes visionary public response to crisis. And so if you take the disruption that was the invention of electricity and electric appliances, um, you know, to basically industrialize and modernize our industrial production, we municipalized electricity, but we also created a regulatory system, state-based regulatory system to regulate what is a kind of a natural monopoly. We took ideas from, from England and that worked until the Great Depression. And then we created a rural utility service as a visionary public response to help electrify areas where for-profit companies wouldn't do that. We created wholesale markets, we've created FERC, we've created all these things um, as kind of this managed response to what is our, what we call a free market economy. Now, I think that this idea, I'm going to get to my point, but <laughs> I, want to, I want to put a bookmark here and say, you know, there was this point during the COVID um, pandemic where one Sunday night, the Fed committed $10 trillion to back up Wall Street. That wasn't democratic. Nobody took a vote. And just to put that into context, you know, the federal budget, the previous federal budget was three and a half, three point six trillion dollars. So that's basically printing $10 trillion. Basically, we just pointed the money gun, you know, and that's one of the interesting things about the US economy is that. I guess we do have this magic money tree and I guess we can print money. And if we can't print money, why aren't we printing it for good things? Why are we just creating zombie companies and speculation? And how come it's so hard to 
get a $600 check or to expand unemployment. So I don't know what, I don't know what to call what we have, but I, what I do know is that whatever we have, it's made people in this country intolerant to even the smallest amount of economic suffering, which is really strategically detrimental if we want to talk about a realistic disposition towards resource use and towards like a healthy society. And for in our business, which is, you know, what the MREA tries to do, there are really two sides of the energy economy, right? Solar is not creating Large solar farm, South 54, 250 megawatts, totally support it. That is on one side of the ledger. That's on that's owned by a monopoly utility that gets paid to build things. There's no real cost control. There's no market competition. All of that electricity gets paid back by future ratepayers plus interest. And it's in their interest on this side of the ledger for us to be captive ratepayers and pay that back. It's actually the most expensive way to build the electricity economy in the future is just take the same business model and trade in fossil fuels for uh, solar and wind. What you really need is a smart distribution system that empowers customers to use energy more wisely and gives us market incentives and gives us a market to do that because then we have to build us over here. Then we can match supply and demand. Then we can have cost recovery and we can escape bad decisions that are made by monopoly or by utilities. What's happening now is that we in this country consume per capita 3.5x more than any of the next even close countries. And not only that, but we will gladly speculate on something like cryptocurrency, which is now the fifth biggest energy user by country in the world and provides really no useful service. It's just a giant speculation. So. For me, it's hard to really wrap my mind around the insanity that is our energy use and the justification to just build, 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 and build. When we know that efficiency is the cheapest electricity on the grid, we know that we could get by with way less. Um, and so I think it is this constant conundrum for me um, is that how do we, as an organization, engage? This travesty that we call a free market, um, and at the same time advocate for policies and, and actions that bring us at least to a better place. Maybe not a perfect place, but a better place. Yeah, this is a this is a tough question. Um, thanks everybody for going before me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just reading the question, how it stands where I'm at in my role, it's kind of just perplexing, right? I spend most of my days fighting for people to eat and have more access to whole foods, whole healthy foods, right? Like, that's nuts. In my opinion, that's nuts. And I think it really is, it was started, not to have a history lesson here, um, but to kind of chirp touch on Trevor's point is like there's no when you think of food it needs to be convenient to the average American and anything that's inconvenient you know they're just going to go to the cheaper more convenient product and um, I blame capitalism for that uh, on the flip side of it do I think capitalism is necessarily ugly thing I mean it's how we it's how our markets work right now so you're not changing it and it's like how do you sit at the table with it and influence it um i don't claim to have any of the answers i just know that it really impacts our work um through i would say motivation because it, it it's something different when you get a group of passionate young or old or any individuals you get a passionate group of people like the staff that works at Farm Shed. And they're just so set on this makes sense to human health, human development, and everything else. But why do we fight for it? Why, why isn't it just like what we do? Why is local food considered a, a boutique, more expensive alternative? And um, 
I don't know. That's just what we what we try combating and what we are trying to influence to be um, more normal. And uh, hopefully, capitalism can form to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So I'm gonna squeeze two questions into one, and then try and end with one. So uh, we're getting a little close on time, so I'm going to ask you to really try and curate the answers here. Uh, so uh, the first question I'm going to combine into two is, um, can you tell us a success story related to your work, whatever you think that is, uh, or however you process that, and then what keeps you optimistic about what you're doing and where we're going? So that's the first question. Uh, so give us a success story related to your work and what keeps you optimistic. And who hasn't started yet? Kelly, I don't think you've started yet, so, right? No, not yet. There you go. <laughs> okay, a success story. Well, I think that um, it might be a cop-out, but I think it's a, a huge victory that Bucket Ruckus exists and we're doing what we're doing. Um, it's not it's not really that easy to wedge yourself into the waste and materials recovery industry. It's not like we've got a lot of competition here, but it certainly exists in other places. And I'm, I'm grateful for the climate here in Stevens Point for my business to, to grow and be successful. And I do believe that's going to happen. Um, I would say, you know, if we like take a look at some numbers so far since we started this project under Rising Standard Annex in 2018, we've diverted. Uh, 277,000 pounds of organic material from landfill disposal, which is close to 130,000 pounds of CO2 equivalent. So that is a victory. And uh, personally, I wish those numbers were higher for being in business for four years, but I'm confident that that's gonna, we're gonna um, keep growing and grow well. So I'm looking forward to increasing those numbers. As far as what keeps me optimistic, uh, I would probably say that I am optimistic about some things. Uh, I don't know if I have a baseline optimism going on, uh, but I, I do feel, like I've said many times today, I feel good about the growth of our business. I think that this community is ready for it. I think we've got the support here, and I am optimistic about that. I would say that um, optimism is maybe sometimes like a fuel or like some kind of motivation. And I think my motivation comes from other places. Um, I feel pretty fed up with a lot of stuff in this world. And um, that's what keeps me going. So it's uh, it's hard work to, to keep it from being a negative feedback loop. And I'm not always successful at that, but I, I know that I'm not the only person here that deals with that. So um, yeah. I'm optimistic about some things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, success story. We got tens of thousands of Americans to contact their, their members of Congress and support the uh, Build Back Better bill. Uh, we got 49 members of the uh, Senate to support it. We got uh, hundreds of people in the House to support it. It has now uh, been, uh, it's probably dead. But the the elements that are in it are not dead, especially the element that is in it that's not dead is climate change. There will be climate action. Um, when it will happen, I don't know. Uh, May, June, uh, as you know, there was one senator who opposed the passage of that bill, and that was enough to keep it from, from uh, going through. And um, that senator said the one thing in that bill that he most supports is climate action. So there will be something come out. Will it be enough to deal with the severity of the problem we're facing? I don't know. If not, we are not gonna go away. We're gonna keep working until that happens. So that's our success story. It's a partial success story, but after 10 years, and that's how long we've, well, actually we've been working on it 13 years, but I've been working on it for 10 years. Um, I'm really happy about that. Um, what keeps me optimistic? There is a statement that um, a lot of people believe that if you uh, have hope, you can then have action. And that's probably true. You have hope, you can take action. But I think it's uh, equally true that if you take action, you'll have hope. And so what keeps me optimistic is 
we have thousands, thousands of people here in the United States working to keep this a livable planet. And uh, that gives me hope that we will do something about the current uh, calamity that's uh, facing our nation and the rest of the planet. I think a success story is um, kind of pairs with my optimism. Um, but in the last two years, we've seen an uptick in local food and the focus of it. Um, we're sitting at the table with new partners, some that may or may not have been envisioned at being uh, partners with Farm Shed, but we're coming to um, the common ground of helping people. So I think that, and as we look to help people more through the power of food, I'd like, I think a lot of more success is destined to happen. Um, now, it's next, it's tough, it's delicate to say, but everything has got a silver line, right? I'd like to believe so. In the COVID-19, there was a small one in there. I, everybody who lost somebody and all that, that I wish that for nobody, but the disruption in the supply chain to food there and to be so great that now we're starting to see institutions like school districts be able to flex their budget in making it available or making it accommodate how local food is grown and moved. I think that's a lot to be optimistic about. I think people experiencing such a disruption of grocery store shelves being empty was probably some hard reality that a lot of people needed to see if they're going to, you know, value their food system a little bit better. So I think those couple things, though they were tough lessons and could have came a different way. Um, I think, you know, thinking about sustainability around food, uh, I think it kind of perpetuated a lot more Americans to think differently. And that's what I'm optimistic about. <clears throat> yeah, MREA, uh, more than 650 people a year come through our training program. Uh, we've done 64 community education programs. How people solar and uh, more than 3,500 homes and businesses have bought 117 megawatts of solar. Through that, we have a partnership called Solar Core with 18 different uh, two-year college programs in the Midwest. We have a website, solar.jobs. It's turned into a workforce hub for, for solar training. Um, and we, one of the things that we've done recently that's really keeps me optimistic is we started a fundraising program with community partners serving um, economically depressed areas in the Midwest, and we've already raised like ninety over ninety thousand dollars, average contribution size like just over a hundred dollars, and uh, we put sixty four or five people through training. We're basically just getting started, um, and one of the ways that we do all this is we only stay positive. We don't we don't talk about we don't you can scour our information and you won't find any alarmism find any negatives, it's all positives, because people, there is a large segment of the population out there that's really only, only re receptive to positive messaging. And we have a lot of good things to talk about. And when it comes to like clean energy deployment, we don't need to use the word climate change. It's not that I don't think that that's appropriate and that some people should do that, but we need to divide and conquer here. If we talk about economic benefits, we talk about free market benefits. Uh, we talk about local economic development, job benefits. We focus on those messages because we're a big tent organization. And as much as we are about as we are, you know, alternative energy, the odd outfit outside of Stevens Point, you know, but at the same time, we we have a large and diverse partnership network because of our intention of focusing on positive action. And uh, that has also brought us uh, employees that have that in top of mind. So I am just blessed to work with a group of people that are always, always, despite whatever might be in front of them, always working for positive outcomes. And so I kind of, I, I want to agree with Dan here. You know, there are really, if you're a, if you, uh, if you're a student at a university, you've lost, in my opinion, the ability to claim it. 
and if you're graduate, if you're, especially if you teach at a university. <laughs> and in that ability, there are two ways to operate. And that's creative tension or destructive tension. There will always be tension because you'll always see how imperfect the world is and how many challenges there are. Destructive tension is negativity. It's inaction. It's complaining. It's all of the like low level BS that we hear in the news all the time. Creative tension is how are we how are we struggling towards a goal? And if we are there, if we have a goal in mind, and regardless of the setbacks, we're crawling our way there. That's that's where optimism comes from. All right, tough one to follow. Um, one success story for Curbwise myself is working with Bucket Ruckus. Yes, super awesome. I cherish the the partners that I get to deliver for, and because of Kelly, uh, their vision. Um, Basically, I get to pick up compost buckets for about 28 to 32 different customers in the center of Stevens Point. Uh, and that's pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. What keeps me optimistic and similar to Kelly as well, um, sometimes I struggle with thinking because I do a lot of it on that tricycle. <laughs> I refuse to wear earbuds, you know, I refuse to listen to music because that would distract from my focus of staying safe and making sure I'm communicating well with other objects on the road and other people. Um, but the things that keep me optimistic, coincidentally, are those reactions from people on the street. Um, I'll get thumbs up. I'll get waves. I'll get people smiling ear to ear. I'll get people shouting out the window, not vulgarities. I, I promise, not vulgarities, but they'll be like, go, Trevor, or yeah, or whatever it is. And I'm like, that was awesome, you know, it totally energizes me. Um, so I'll get some of those in person, which are my favorite, um, but then I'll also get really positive remarks on social media too. And just new customers, they say, you know, I, 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 you actually brought me closer to local food. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that was super cool to hear. Uh, one of my recent regular customers said that. I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Of course, that tie to Farm Shed was the, complete circle <laughs> for that local food, but yeah. Great. Last question. Um, so I'm going to take liberty again as I can. So I want you to think about what advice you would give your college age self and how would you think or interpret that applies to students who are graduating in May of 2015? So what advice would you give your college age self and how would you interpret that or apply that to college students who are gonna be graduating uh, in just a few weeks? And since you've got the mic, we'll make it easy <laughs> and let you finish it off and set it down. Sure. Um, well, I'd say two things. I would advise my former self in the college years. I won't say when that happened. And it was here, by the way, I forgot to mention. I am also an alum. Um, two things. That would be volunteer as much as you can. I did a little bit, but I wish I would have done more. Uh, there's so many cool things you can learn, uh, relationships you can build, and you never know. There might be an eventual tangential benefit of landing a job in the future because X, Y, or Z person was at that company when you were a volunteer. Um, of course, it's always ideal to align that volunteer role with something you're passionate about. Uh, the second thing is don't stress too much about that first job. <laughs> don't stress too much about it. Um, you'll just be amazed, you know, 40 years from now or whenever it is, you'll be like, wow, I've had six jobs <laughs> since I graduated from, that is interesting. Uh, you, you'll probably change careers. It, it happens. Uh, mine happened during COVID. You know, who would have thought a pandemic could have came? Um, but man, I pivoted and things are pretty neat. So uh, yeah, don't stress too much about that. I would tell myself to not remain in a box. Don't, don't put yourself in a box. Don't stay there. And 
uh, even though it's going to be hard to reckon with, you are uh, capable of so much more than you realize. So much more than you've even thought of. You can never think of it. You never plan for it. <laughs> and I think that's true for most everybody. Um, unfortunately, just the way that kids are raised in this world, um, sometimes it's really, really hard to believe in yourself. So uh, I would say to folks who are graduating this spring, um, keep that in mind and um, trust yourself. And just because you got a degree in this thing doesn't mean you can't go do this thing over there or do this over here for a year and then go back to that other thing. And, um, it's your life. You make the rules. Mine's the other side of the coin. <laughs> I graduated from college, came here and, and uh, held the same job for 35 years. Uh, nonetheless, she's right. Uh, find out what it is that you enjoy, what it is that you find satisfying, and um, do that. It adds five more days to your uh, week of, of uh, weekends, five more days of weekends. Um, what, I, what advice would I give my college age self? I would um, urge my college age self to do what I've urged probably thousands of college age students to do, um, and that is get involved outside of the classroom. You will learn more outside of your classroom than you will learn in your classroom. You will learn it from your fellow students. You will learn it from people that you have daily contact with. Um, get involved. Uh, join political organizations, join non-political organizations, join and, and get to know other people and uh, get to realize they, they all have only one head and um, they are like you in some respect and unlike you in others and you can learn from that other one. Um, as for people graduating now, what, what advice would I give them? I, my advice is uh, live an ethical life. Uh, th that's why I got involved with climate change. To me, it doesn't seem ethical to destroy the world we're given. There is a new film that's come out and I'm working real hard to get my hands on it called Youth v. Gov. And it's about a lawsuit that the 28, at the time, youths brought against the US federal government saying, you're not meeting your obligation. You're supposed to give us uh, the same kind of planet to live on that you had to live on and you're not doing that. That has gone through the federal courts and bounced and bounced and bounced and presidents have interceded and tried to stop it and it's still out there as far as I know. Um, get involved. You will find it to be a more satisfying life. You will find it to be a more rewarding life and I, I think you live a more ethical life. I think that's a good thing to do. Yeah, um, I'll start with the advice I'd give my college age self, volunteer more, um, really. Uh, one, whether you notice it or not, it does help build a community that you want to live in by you know, choosing where you volunteer. Um, so that would be the biggest advice I'd give myself. What I'd give the college grads um, now is really like step outside your comfort, comfort zone often and be prepared to fail, but just know like, that's okay. Um, as long as you continue to learn from your failure. Um, it's kind of cliche, but that really is, uh, I think it's really pivotal to our growth as humans um, to even live ethical lives. I think, you know, you're gonna fail along the way of achieving that. So that's, that's what I would say. Oh, my college age self. Would, would my college age self even listen to it? <laughs> I was trying to give myself advice to that. Listen to it. Hey, uh, I can't. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah right. go to half as many parts. Um, no, I would say um, focus on opportunities and being able to kind of like you. Were born, the zip code you were born in gave you more privilege than any human that ever existed before you. Like, act like it um, and, and use it to the best of your ability uh, to 
to make your life better and to make the life of others better. Um, and, and to listen more and to see the redeeming uh, qualities of people and help nurture those redeeming qualities, be less oppositional. Um, and I learned that uh, for the most part, <laughs> still working on it. Uh, what would I give to advice that I give to college grads? Um, all of this is about people. Organizations are made of people. Decisions are made by people. Amazing things are done by people. Terrible things are done by people. Uh, and work with people that you love. Work with people that inspire you. It's not about the job. It's about the people. All of it. All of it is about people. And uh, and so support. The, the people that need support, we the people that need to be led, and uh, and I'll just echo: it's all about experience, and often that starts with volunteering. Um, I volunteered a lot, had very little money, and look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to say thank you uh, for coming and being part of this today. Uh, we did record it, so I'm sure we'll be able to get it out uh, so that way more people can see it. Um, and I've got some remarks here that I'm supposed to read that I'm not going to read them. Uh, <laughs> but listening to you all uh, makes me optimistic about the future. Uh, so, and uh, makes me thankful to share this community and, and this space with you. Um, I, I could sit and would have gladly asked all of these questions and sat here for another hour and listened to you all this time. So thank you so much uh, for coming and being part of this today. I really appreciate it. Uh, folks that are still here, if you've got some questions, then we'll mingle around for another 15 minutes. But thank you so much for coming. Uh, really great session. Thank you. Thank you.